Hello Street Talkers and welcome back to the channel. Today we had a really cool conversation with Zach Jolst. He's a research scientist from Amazon and his specialism is in graph neural networks and geometric deep learning, which of course I'm very interested in as well. So yeah, we, uh, we spoke all about message passing and a whole bunch of stuff around that. But anyway, I hope this video gives you a bit of a feel for what a cool guy Zach is and more importantly, how much of a good educator he is. And the reason I'm saying that is he's gone and created a course. He spent the last six months or so creating a few courses, in fact, all around graph neural networks. And you can sign up. I think the current cohort is nearly full, but there's still time for you to sign up if you do it quickly. And there's a link in the video description, which will give you folks about $50 off. Um, anyway, if you like content like this, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. I really love reading your comments. That's one of the most fun things for me having a YouTube channel is uh, reading, reading the comments that, that you folks send in. Anyway, enjoy the conversation. Cheers. So anyway, here we are. Zach, welcome to Unplugged. Hey, good to see you, man. It's been a while. It has been a while. Can you, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. My name is Zach Jost. I uh, am applied scientist at AWS right now. I also have a YouTube channel, The Welcome AI Overlords. I've uh, recently been spending a lot of time building a course on graph neural networks, just kind of finished up the content creation for that. So now I'm getting back into the world of making YouTube content. Amazing. And I just watched your recent interview. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The paper was called Equivariant Subgraph Aggregation Networks, and it was about mm -hmm. essentially breaking the bottleneck that GNNs currently have. That's uh, an artifact of message passing. And we can dig deeper into that if you want. But essentially, whenever you're uh, using a GNN, what most of them do is that when you're calculating a prediction for a node on a graph, you gather the information from its connected neighborhood and uh, use that to inform the prediction. And the problem is that since these things have the symmetry about uh, this permutation symmetry so that there's no natural ordering to the nodes, that you have to use a function that sort of allows that permutation symmetry. But by doing that, by restricting to that class of functions, you end up having these blind spots so that two neighborhoods that are actually different can look the same to this function and generate the same output. And that gives you a sort of bottleneck for expressive power. So okay. they were uh, exploring that idea and then generated a method that will break those symmetries that, that cause that bottleneck and uh, then therefore give you more expressive power. Okay. There are so many things to unpack. I mean, first of all, folks, everyone must subscribe to Zach's YouTube channel. So uh, Zach is, is an insane specialist, especially when it comes to graph neural networks. And, and as you were just saying, he's put a course together. We'll go through that course and, and, and we'll talk about the various different things in it in, in a minute. But I suggest you sign up to that course as well. Um, I feel like Zach and I have been in it since the beginning because we, we created our YouTube channel, I think, at a similar time. So um, we, we've been on a similar yeah. trajectory. And maybe we should rewind a little bit to geometric deep learning in general. So, um, I spoke with, uh, uh, Michael Bronstein et al, and they formalized this notion of geometric deep learning, which is a blueprint for many of the deep learning architectures, whether it's RNNs or CNNs or GNNs or transformers. And they defined it a bit like a sandwich where you have group equivariant layers. And they are equivariant in respect of a symmetry transformation. And the symmetry could be translation in time or space, or it could be permutation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have uh, a local um, uh, pooling layer, and then you rinse and repeat that several times. And at the end, you have a globally invariant layer, which is usually the MLP. And it's quite interesting that all of the neural network architectures are basically instances of that blueprint. Yeah, um, their work is fascinating, and uh, if I'm being perfectly honest, I struggle to understand a lot of it. You know, it, it's like it's been a journey for me to try to build up the base, and then I'll you know read their stuff. It's it's over my head, and then I'll find some nugget of an idea that I appreciate the uh, core of it. But I, you know, it's like trying to figure out an elephant with your eyes closed. You know, you're like you're starting to feel a bit of a shape, <laughs> but. Uh, I don't have a clear picture. So then I kind of disappear for a couple months and read some other papers and I'll see something that goes, oh, that reminds me of that thing I read in the, in Bronstein's group's work. And then I'll go back and read it and it makes a little bit more sense. And so I'm not completed in that journey yet, but I'm, 
<laughs> I'm still in it and I'm further along than I was months ago. But uh, yes, this, first of all, the idea for, of equivariant versus invariant, I think is, you know, that took me a little bit to understand, but it's actually quite simple. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just say it out loud for other people that may Please. not be up to speed yet. So equivariant and invariant, the difference is that, for example, if you have permutation equivariance, that means if you shuffle around the inputs, then the output that you get will also be shuffled. Whereas in the case of invariant, if you shuffle around the inputs, you get the exact same output. So one sort of keeps the symmetry by moving around in the same way. Um, and the other one just ignores the symmetry and generates the same output. So for convolutional neural networks, for example, you have this filter that you kind of scan across the image. And if you have a, a cat detector that lights up when there's a cat, well, if you move the cat to a different part of the image, then the part that lights up will also move. And that's equivariant. Um, but the invariant is like pooling, like you said, where maybe you just have something that says, there's a cat or there's not a cat in this entire image. And in that case, it doesn't matter where the cat is. You're going to get the same output if there is or is not one. So that took a little bit for me to appreciate the difference. But uh, yeah, the, yeah, that recipe you see reflected all over the place when, whenever there's a symmetry that can be exploited. And of course, the reason you want to exploit these sorts of symmetries is the architectures you get are more parameter efficient, basically. So yeah, those filters, exactly. you know, are shared across the image. And that's a lot easier to do than to have to learn um, a filter for cat over here and a different filter for cat over here and so on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I spoke with Juan Bruna mm. and he was saying, oh, you know, well, the problem with machine learning is there are all of these curses everywhere and all of these different um, kind of sources of error. And he spoke about approximation error and statistical error and optimization error. And he said that, um, you know, with these different architectures, one of the most important things that we do to, to reduce one of these curses, a computational curse, is to um, reduce the approximation class or the hypothesis space. Mm. So in machine learning, we're trying to find a function. Well, we're trying to approximate a function, you know, to represent the actual function. And if that class is too big, we'll be searching forever. So what we could do is, is reduce the size of functions we're searching through, but then that, that introduces approximation error, because even if we find the best function in that space, it might not, you know, um, it might not have enough fidelity to represent the actual function that, that, that we want to, uh, learn, but so all of these different group symmetry equivariant layers, the group means a group of symmetry transformations. And in the case of a CNN, the symmetry is translational uh, symmetry. Mm -hmm. So what we're basically saying is we now have a much smaller approximation class because rather than learn this thing in every possible position, we only learn the thing prototypically and then it could be represented in any position. It's interesting all the different sort of, if you read the theory side of a lot of these things, to me, I like my brain works better by getting an intuitive understanding of why something would work. And then the theory kind of helps make connections in ways that I, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be obvious starting out. And it's kind of interesting to hear the perspective you just laid out of the function class and restricting that and it making basically an easier optimization problem maybe is, is kind of the crux of that. But uh, there's all, all sorts of other different approaches theoretically that talk about the same part of uh, a different part of the same elephant, you know, and it, that's kind of the, the fun part for me of exploring these more theoretical papers is it just kind of makes different parts of your brain light up. And then if you do that over a long enough time on a, enough topics, I think that's what helps researchers, you know, bring new and, and innovative approaches like basically Bronstein and the geometric, they're bringing this perspective of these um, symmetries. I think he has a physics background and uh, then this, these other types of geometries and stuff that uh, seems to be a fruitful way of exploring. And now they're bringing in partial differential equations and and uh, treating them as like continuous diffusion equations that are now when you discretize them, it's uh, these GNN layers. And so it's just a totally different way of looking at it that my brain would have never thought of, but 
and it's really enriching to kind of go through some of these different approaches. I know it really fascinates me how deep ideas can marshal different domains of science or, you know, for example, ideas in physics come coming into machine learning. And when we spoke to Bronstein, he, he showed us the book by Roger Penrose, which is the road to reality. And he said, if I could sum up this entire book with one word, it would be symmetry. That seems to be the, uh, the modus operandi in the world of physics. Yeah. I, I bought that book as a response to him recommending it. And, uh, man, it's a, it's not light reading, so <laughs> still working on that one. <laughs> I started to read it. There, there was, I think the first chapter was all about um, the platonic forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that's as far as I got. But I'd, there are so many books. It's, it's absolutely insane um, how, how many books that I need to read yeah. at the moment. So um, let, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, graph neural networks because this, this is your, your area of specialism. And um, we were speaking to a guy actually last week all about cellular automata. And that's mm. very, very similar to graph neural networks in this sense of uh, message passing, right? So in a cellular automata, you kind of like, um, you're on a, a grid, uh, uh, on a planar manifold. And that has this idea that every single node is, is connected to its neighbors. But, um, you could generalize that to a graph where the concept of a neighborhood, uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be a, a gridded surface anymore, but that's quite similar to message passing in, in the sense that what you do is you run some code that runs on every single pixel or in a graph, it would be on every single node and you're passing information between the nodes because you're executing a whole bunch of rules. And so you can think of, of graph neural networks as being a generalization of CNNs in that sense that you're just passing information between the neighboring pixels. Uh, so this notion of message passing is absolutely critical for GNNs, right? Yeah, for sure. So the connection with uh, CNNs, as you're saying, the question might be, well, why not just use CNNs? <clears throat> well, the, the really only complication here is that with a grid of pixels, the number of neighbors is stable around a pixel. You know, you're going to look at the immediate neighborhood or maybe a larger um, receptive field, but whenever you're moving that thing, the number of neighbors is going to be consistent and your filter is essentially going to learn a, a number to multiply each of those pixel values by, and then there's some aggregation operation like a sum or, or whatever. Um, in the case of graphs, of course, the number of, of neighbors is different for the various nodes. So you can't imagine a single filter because the next neighbor, the next node might have seven neighbors, whereas the previous had five. So you need a way to handle that. And um, Kip Finn Welling created the Graph Convolution Network, but that had built up on, on previous work that were basically trying to define what a convolution operation is on a graph. And the way they found to do this essentially was to go into the frequency domain and taking the, the graph for a transform, basically. And um, then what they did was it, this world of wavelets, which is, so um, in the case of Fourier transform, you sort of localize the frequency, you break it down into its various frequency components. And then if, if you know anything about audio filtering, for example, like a equalizer on a radio or whatever, you basically take the Fourier transform of the, the audio signal, which casts it into a frequency space. And then your little sliders on your equalizer just amplify or diminish the uh, content that's in that frequency band. And then when it comes out of the filter, it takes the inverse Fourier transform to get it back to your regular um, audio space of just amplitude versus time. And then now the filter has been applied and that's your kind of modified version of the signal. So we wanna do something similar here where we're taking the Fourier transform of the graph and then you apply um, a multiplication on the different frequencies that will reduce or amplify them. And then you take the inverse Fourier transform of the graph and there is your convolution applied because the convolution theorem says that convol uh, convolution in one domain is multiplication in the um, other domain, which is um, Fourier domain in this case. So we have this kind of simple recipe. The only problem is that when you take the Fourier transform of a graph, First of all, you have to find all of its eigenvectors, which is an expensive operation. I think it goes as 
n cubed, where n is the number of nodes. And for billions of graphs, or billions of nodes in a large graph, that's obviously quite a bit. And there are approximation schemes and so on, but still, that's uh, expensive. And then the, the next problem is that each eigenvector will depend on all of the nodes. And that means you're inherently non-local. And if you were to sort of have a, a perturbation or something on, on a single node, it's going to be impacting all of the other ones. And what we like in um, convolutional neural networks on images, for example, is that you're kind of restricting the information to be this little local neighborhood. So long story short, the way they solve this problem, and this was back to the graph wavelets work. Uh, so the, a wavelet is not only localized in frequency, like the Fourier transform does, because that breaks it down into frequency components, but it also localizes the impact in the original spatial domain. So the way they basically did this was they defined the Fourier transform and then they approximated it as a polynomial in the adjacency matrix or the Laplacian. So why would you do that? Well, if you take a, uh, a set of features for your nodes and you multiply it by the adjacency matrix, that does message passing. So if you, if you recall, the adjacency matrix is zero for things that are not connected. So let's say you're looking at the first row, so that's node one. There's a one where it's connected to all the other nodes. So you have uh, the set of rows that represent the, uh, the, the nodes and the set of columns that also represent the nodes. And there's zeros where they're not connected and ones where they are. And when you multiply the adjacency matrix by the features, what you end up doing is just adding up the uh, the features of all the connected neighbors, and that's message passing, right? So, if you just think through the the uh, matrix multiplication, it's like you're going down the uh, the zeros and ones, and you're adding it up when you're multiplying the various features. And this ask, uh, acts like a mask, right? You're multiplying by zero all the things that are not connected, and multiplying by one all the things that are, and adding it all up. And that's just a form of message passing. So if you multiply by the adjacency matrix one time, you're getting all of the nearest neighbors. If you multiply by the adjacency matrix squared, you're aggregating the two hop neighborhood. So that's all of that. A squared represents all of the paths between two nodes. So if there's like, you know, you go to one neighbor and then back, then that's one path, or you could go to, you know, you could imagine many different paths through the graph, basically, to go from one node to another. And the value in the A squared basically tells you how many paths exist between um, two nodes. And that generalizes to the kth power of the adjacency matrix. So if you went to A to the fifth power, then you would have a number of how many paths of length, length five exist between two nodes. So what they did That's fascinating. was they expressed an approximation, they said, okay, we're just going to do a polynomial expansion to the convolution using powers of the adjacency matrix. And obviously, you know, it's just like any other polynomial expansion, the, the more terms, the more accurate it's going to be. And, you know, they were smart in which um, polynomial, they use Chebyshev polynomials that, that have certain properties that basically make it a good approximator using a small number of terms. And they talk about this in the graph wavelets paper. But in any case, they have this polynomial expansion. And then they say, okay, let's just restrict it to the first term. So we have the adjacency matrix to the zero with power, which is a constant, plus adjacency matrix to the first power. And then there's parameters that you know are multiplying this. And what that does is that localizes the information to be in a one-hop neighborhood. And that solves the problem of if I use the full Fourier transform, I have non-local information through throughout the entire graph, which is a bad thing, right? And also it's not intuitive to say this node on the total other side of the graph is going to have a, an influence on my current node. That's In most problems, that's not really relevant. What you need is just the immediate neighborhood. So by approximating the convolution as a first order approximation, uh, with the adjacency matrix, you've now limited 
the uh, the places the information can come from from each node. And that was kind of the unlocking idea that allowed graph convolutional networks. Because not only have you localized the information, but you've also made it just this really simple linear equation where it's just the adjacency matrix multiplied by the features, and then you pass that through a nonlinearity, and that's it. So this is really interesting because this reminds me a little bit, again, in, in Bronstein and uh, Velichkovich's work, they were talking about how they could re-derive the uh, convolution, uh, yeah, convolution on your networks from first principles using the convolution theorem and, and a shift matrix, and and as you know, mm -hmm. like a convolution on your network can be represented with with a um, with with a, a single affine transformation. And si similarly, um, this is the magic of linear algebra that you can you can represent this kind of uh, local message passing with with an affine transformation, which is fascinating. Um, but there's there's a dichotomy, isn't there, between going bottom up to represent information and top down. Presumably, there are some advantages to uh, global um, information sharing, but so often is the case, again, with cellular automata, by the way, that going bottom up can give you a surprising degree of global coherence and information. So why does it work so well going bottom up? There's a, a paper that I read a long time ago, back when I was in the world of physics, that I uh, I didn't understand that well. I, I understood the message of it, but I didn't understand much beyond that. And uh, his name is William Bialik. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I believe he's at Princeton. And it's a paper that's showing how uh, most systems and their complicated behavior can be explained by pairwise interactions. And there's some things that can't. Um, but the amount of things that can't are very small. And I think that's, I, I may be uh, misapplying that because, again, I did not understand it deeply. But it seems to me like message passing in these, which essentially are pairwise interactions, right? It's one node is sending information to another node. That you can capture quite a lot of, of information that models a system with just that. And there are some cases, so there are blind spots, and I'm sure we'll get into this because this is related to the bottleneck of GNNs and the bottleneck of their expressive power. That, uh, for example, closed triangles versus open triangles are hard to distinguish. And that's because that's inherently a, a three node operation, right? It's like you can't receive a message from this node to tell you if it's connected to this node necessarily. That it's more like, are all three of these connected? You need to kind of know the state of all three of those things. And unfortunately, closed triangles are actually really important for a lot of tasks. So you, um, my background in machine learning is a lot with fraud detection. And you can imagine that if you have closed triangles, that means these kind of tightly knit communities. And that's often what you see with these coordinated attacks by fraudsters. And if you can't distinguish that, then uh, that's a problem. Now. It's not to say that GNNs can't tell tightly connected communities from ones that are not. That's not true. But there are certain structures and certain edge cases where they have a hard time. And uh, that's powering a lot of the, the work along that direction of this bottleneck. And first of all, trying to characterize it, but then also trying to break it and sort of unlock more expressive power. But there's also quite a bit of uh, sort of lingering questions around if this is even that important because on all of the benchmark data sets we have these really uh these architectures that come out and have the more expressive power don't really perform that much better than what we have with just message passing with the bottlenecks yeah. inside so the question is well is that because um i i wonder is is there two possibilities one is that we just don't need more expressive power for the realistic task in that these kind of corner cases of where it fails are just not prevalent in real life graphs. That could be one case. The other is that it's not so much a question right now of bottlenecks of expressive power, but in terms of recipes of training GNNs that, you know, maybe we need our, our batch norm or whatever it is, these kind of tricks of training and optimization that are really the things that are hurting us right now. And then we'll run into the bottleneck question sort of down the road. So yeah. 
I don't know which of those it is or a third one that I haven't thought of. But Well, I, I think it's related to the bias trade trade-off. I mean, we, we've been speaking a lot recently about why do neural networks use uh, piecewise linear uh, functions, you know, for their approximation class. Um, all of the equations in physics that we've derived are nonlinear functions. But it, it's coming back to what we were saying earlier, that if you make the approximation class too big, then you've just got too much stuff to search through. And actually, if you have too much bias in your model as well, it, could, it can actually make you worse on average. That's the, that's the paradox of machine learning, isn't it? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in so many things that you've just said there. One first thought that came to my mind is, again, in, in cellular automata, one thing that they do is is they don't perform the update synchronously. They start doing it stochastically. Because what we've been speaking about in, gra in graph neural networks and the message, message passing is that it happens synchronously. And because neural networks have a fixed amount of compute and there are certain structures, um, you would need to perform that computation iteratively um, several times, presumably, in order for you to recognize certain structures in, in, the, in the graph. If there, if there was a ring structure in the graph, if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think this is getting to why we need to have several equivariant uh, layers, you know, permutation equivariant mm -hmm. layers in the graph, because you would actually need to effectively perform message passing a discrete number of times in order to detect that structure effectively. Right. The number of GNN layers you have, let's just speak sort of approximately there are some architectures that do things differently but in general one gnn layer is one stage of message passing mm -hmm. and if the information you need is uh five or six steps away then you need five or six gnn layers if you're just following the kind of standard approach and that just doesn't work very well for a number of reasons the first is that they call it the over smoothing problem where if you uh, do a stage of message passing, you combine all of the information from your neighbors along with the information of yourself and then apply it through some neural network or whatever the function is. And this comes up with a new representation of that node. And then if you repeat this operation, you gather the neighbors, you take your current representation. So it's like a, this continuous update where each time you do message passing, you're pulling in all the information and then updating your own representation. And you can imagine that if you do that over and over and over again, that all the nodes start taking on a very similar representation because they're constantly pulling things in and then eventually they're pulling in things from far away mm -hmm. and you're just making this big homogenous blob. And that's the over smoothing problem. So you have that to contend with. The other is what they call the over squashing problem, which is that even if you don't over smooth, you're gathering a lot of information, an exponentially increasing amount of information. Because when your first set of message passing, you just have your nearest neighbors. And but the second, and let's say you have a D of them, you know, for degree D. And uh, the next set of message passing, your the first one kind of updates everything, and you each node has its neighbor represented. But then the second set, you have your neighbor's neighbors also represented. So that's kind of D squared. And then if you do it a third time, it's D to the third power. So you have this exponentially increasing amount of information coming that you're supposed to be representing with these kind of fixed size vectors. And um, that's the oversquashing problem. It's also seen kind of in recurrent neural networks, right? That if you have your RNN and you're going over a very long sequence length, you're still you're now trying to cram in a lot of information mm -hmm. from this long sequence into a, this fixed size vector. And eventually you could imagine running out of capacity because even from an information theoretic point of view, and the, the paper on over squashing does a really nice job of this, that, you know, you, let's say you have a vector with uh, eight 32 bit floats. Well, you know precisely how many configurations that could possibly differentiate, right? Because each bit, can tell you um, whether it's one configuration versus not, and you know how many bits are in this vector. So if you have more configurations than that, you can't possibly um, differentiate among them with a vector of that size. And the number of possible configurations explodes if your receptive field is increasing exponentially. So you have to deal with that problem. One of the ways they've been 
dealing with that is uh, this kind of graph rewiring work, which is there's nothing to say that the graph you're given in your data is the right graph for doing message passing. It's the most natural one, but you could also imagine that in these, like, like you're talking about these kind of molecular structures where you might have these aromatic rings that require these kind of six hops away before you even know you're in a ring. Well, maybe the computation graph should be different than the one of molecules connected by edges or, or atoms connected by edges to build these molecules. And um, this graph rewiring and Bronstein's work of like the Ricci curvature and so on is about finding uh, a process for updating these edges or creating edges where they didn't previously exist and removing edges that do exist because there are certain edges that cause this over squashing problem because they will connect a node to a different disparate connect of densely connected things. And if you could just remove that one edge, you would eliminate a lot of information that needed to be maintained in these vectors. And so that work is about sort of finding those edges that you can selectively remove to optimally reduce this over squashing problem. So there's lots of different approaches out there, but One. you're exactly right. There's a, it's not trivial to just make GNNs deeper because of this exponential increase in the receptive field. And, you know, CNNs do not have that problem, right? Yeah. Uh, it, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm sorry to bring it up again, but it it's, it really makes me think of um, cellular automata because uh, we, we we interviewed a guy called uh, Daniel Gratarola, and um, he he extended cellular automata to graphs. And uh, mm. there's you might have seen there's a, a blog post about um, it's called morphogenesis. So you can essentially have uh, the, the morphogenesis. It was first done on a CNN, and, and then he did it with a graph. So. Um, instead of a normal cellular automata of discrete rules, you have a continuous version and you train a CNN and you train it to reconstruct an image. So you can kind of, you can kind of, um, damage part of it or destroy part of it. And then it will just as an emergent property, the image will recreate itself. And actually what's happening there is in a, in a graph neural network, you have a fixed number of message passing updates, but in a cellular automata, it just, it continuously happens. So, and, and and the the way that these guys were training the the model was to try and make it converge and not degenerate because you were just saying there's this dichotomy between on the one hand the information might squash and on the other hand it might diverge and it might be possible if you imagine this is a continuous process to make it um converge in, in into a good place but what's happening with graph neural networks as you say is is you're you're actually having a discrete number a fixed number of message passing increments and the topology of the under, underlying graph uh, strongly determines where that goes yeah, that actually makes an interesting connection back to something we'd briefly alluded to with Bronstein's work on this uh, partial differential equations. And so, you know, the heat equation, if you remember that from college physics or whatever, it's basically the uh, Laplacian operator, which is this kind of double derivative thing. Um, on. So it's basically a smoothness thing that, you know, heat dissipates and it does it isotropically through the material. So hot spots will um, take their ambient heat and send it to the neighbors and it sort of diffuses down to this um, smooth thing. And um, Bronstein's work, and I, I'm not remembering the first author, so I apologize for that, but I know it's coming from his, his world, are thinking about you know, GNNs as a sort of diffusion process, right? Where right now it's isotropic in that it doesn't matter which neighbor it comes from, they're, they're treated equally, but that may not be the right thing to do. And um, there may be expressive power um, things that you can gain by breaking that requirement. But um, in any case, you were talking about how these are kind of discrete. Well, they've talked about a world where it's not discrete, it's continuous. So what would a continuous GNN layer look like? Or maybe you don't say layer in that case, but a, a continuous message passing framework look like. And um, I didn't, you know, I somewhat understand the way they frame that, but I didn't quite make the connection of how they would 
manifest this into a real life architecture until quite recently, uh, Emmanuel Rossi from Twitter and also has connections from Bronstein released this paper on, uh, it's called something like the unreasonable effectiveness of feature propagation or something like that. And basically what they did was they took this approach of having this diffusion equation that represented information uh, on the graph. And the question is, what if a lot of our feature information is deleted? You know, or if you think about a Twitter graph, you have, let's say, the age and gender and so on of some of your users, but a lot of users just don't give it to you. So you have this missing um, information, missing features on your nodes. Well, they, they treat it as, well, let's do a diffusion equation, this, this partial differential equation, and my boundary conditions will be my observations. So for the nodes where I have the age and gender, that's the considered a boundary condition. And for the ones that I don't have an observation, that's just a thing I need to make an inference about. And I need to find the solution to my differential equation such that it, first of all, matches this um, update kind of diffusion equation, but also matches my boundary conditions. And then, you know, you see that there is a closed form solution to this differential equation, but it's expensive to calculate, of course. So then they say, okay, well, what if we uh, basically initialize things and then play this update equation forward to get a new state and basically do this um, Euler approximation where, you know, I've discretized my steps and I'm just going to update, have a new representation and keep feeding it through this dif differential equation until I meet a steady state. And that's my approximate solution. Well, that is basically GNNs and that is message passing. So it's a, a way to think about what these things are and applying thinking about it from the perspective of a continuous thing that's now been um, had this discrete process put on top and playing mm -hmm. the tape forward until convergence is essentially the formula that that solves this thing given these boundary conditions so i thought that was a nice example of where the rubber meets the road of okay here's this cool way of thinking about it but how do you turn it into something in practice that works and it turns out it works very very well so it, it is neat. a really cool way of thinking about it and um we, we've been speaking recently, ever since we spoke to Randall Balistrio from Meta, it, it completely transformed how I think about neural networks. And, you know, he, he's, without going into too much detail, he's got the spline theory of neural networks, which talks about how all of the neurons are these basis functions, which are relus, they're basically hyperplanes. And in an input sensitive way, mm. the MLPs chop up the, the ambient space up into these polyhedra. Um, so, so it's a bit like a locality sensitive hashing table and then all of the neural network architecture. So all of, you know, in the geometric deep learning blueprint in a variety of different ways, they actually perform information diffusion, just as you were describing. So what they basically do is, is they, um, I mean, the, the, the idealized version would be a cellular automata, but actually it happens with discrete, um, steps of information diffusion. So even a CNN or a GNN, they all work the same way. They basically take the information and they diffuse it so that the information falls into those different polyhedra in the ambient space so that the MLP backend will learn to recognize information in different places. Yeah. And I think, uh, that somewhat drives with the recognition. So we started by talking about the bottleneck of expressive power, but, um, what we have actually seen in a bunch of results is that simple things work really well. And so there was this paper called Correct and Smooth that basically, at, it was somewhat uh, surprising at the time because this very simple recipe that they came out with beat all of the GNNs or many of the GNNs on most of the benchmarks. And the recipe was simply something like fit a model, um, like a, tree-based model, XGBoost or whatever, and um, that has nothing to do with the graph. It just maps features to prediction. And then build your graph and um, apply uh, basically label propagation. But um, the thing you're trying to propagate are the errors or the residuals between the ground truth answer and the predictions. And that basically, you know, assigns an expected error to each of the nodes and then adjust your 
baseline XGBoost score by that error amount, and then apply label propagation on top of that. And that recipe of just doing smoothing where you're finding expected errors so that the intuition here is that if one node has a high error, then its connected neighbor will likely also have a high error. That's the first set. And then the other is that the labels should vary smoothly across the graph. And that worked very, very well. And as someone from industry who's worked on some graph problems, I can tell you label propagation is very hard to beat. It's simple and it's, uh, it's elegant. And it's very similar to what we were just talking about of this idea of playing the tape forward in a differential equation. And the, uh, the feature propagation work that came out of Rossi's paper is almost identical to label propagation. The only difference is that the thing you're propagating is the vector of features and not the label. And um, that, by the way, worked really well too. So it seems like we're coming from this uh, a different perspective on the problem where the thing that the graph is giving you that's really helpful for these tasks and where you're getting your performance benefit is this smoothing over the local graph neighborhood. And like these graph convolutional networks, for example, where we, to bring this um, full circle back home, these low order approximations using um, small powers on the adjacency matrix. Well, these turn out to be low pass filters, meaning that it's um, doing low frequency information, which by definition is things that vary um, slowly across mm -hmm. the graph. So from node, basically it means that there's um, smoothing being done and that works really well and it seems to be that it may simply combining local information and making it smooth is where you get almost all of your benefit from these graph based methods yeah and it the expressive power may be uh not that important yeah i'm just i've got a visual in my mind it, it, it i hadn't i hadn't heard about it uh, this way before so this is fascinating that you're saying you know you change the power on the adjacency matrix and it's almost a little bit like you know with the radial basis function you have you have like this kind of smoothing effect and what you're basically doing is you're saying how much i want to diffuse and smooth the information over my neighborhood as a function of how many um steps in respect of degrees um the, the reason that's interesting is I, I actually thought there must have been a computational reason for this, but it, it's not. It's more of a bottom-up versus top-down reason, because as we were saying at the beginning, it can be harmful to have too much global information. It's much better to diffuse the information bottom-up, bottom because this brings me naturally to the question of transformers. Now, in transformers, it, it is explicitly a quadratic term, and you achieve the permutation um, invariance by looking at all of the K tuples of the items in the set where K equals two in the case of self-attention. So you can think of transformers as being a graph learning problem. So how would you contrast transformers with, let's say, a GCM? Yeah, so there's basically, uh, there has been work that make this connection explicit, but um, essentially you can think of a transformer as a fully connected graph. And if every node is connected to every other node and you do message passing, that is this, you know, K squared um, number of interactions. And they of course have this formal uh, like update mechanism of um, keys and queries and so on. But uh, at, at a high level, GNNs are trying to be more uh, sparse in what it's considering. And, if you have the computational power to consider the interactions of everything with everything else, I don't think we're going to beat that. So transformers are, are going to win probably. Um, unless there's something, you know, the graph encodes relationships and um, inductive priors, if you will, about it says something about how this thing is connected to another thing. And the degree to which that is useful information is the degree to which the graph is going to help you at the end of the day, right? And you could imagine um, there are papers, let's see, I think it was in the over the over squashing paper where basically they had these GNNs that they had stacked together and then their way of showing that there was this inefficiency in 
transmitting information from far away was for the last GNN, they basically made a fully connected adjacency matrix, which kind of approximates to the transformer of everything's going to be able to talk to everything else. And if all of the information you needed was already there, then doing that wouldn't help at all. But it turned out to help in many cases. So that sort of tells you something about how the message passing operation, when the message that you need is far away, is not being transmitted efficiently. So there might be interesting um, lessons we can learn from transformers that will make better GNN architectures. But I, I think really the, the crux of the matter, the, the part I'm most optimistic about are these kind of rewiring techniques, I think, because it's going to be hard to try to increase your receptive field really large to get a message from far away. When at the end of the day, the actual problem from my perspective is that you're using the wrong edges. Like the, the edge you want to encode in your problem is I need information from this thing to make a prediction about this thing. And if you're using edges that directly fall out of your perception of the data, like um, chemical bonds, well, okay, that's that's one way to represent a relationship. But the fact that these things, you know, as an alternative in the case of molecules, maybe instead of representing nodes as atoms, you represent nodes as more complicated things. Maybe you have a node for each aromatic ring, for example. And then you've solved this problem of needing uh, information from six hops away because you're just explicitly saying, I know that aromatic rings are important. So therefore, I'm going to make that a sort of atomic thing in my uh, information that I'm representing. So there, there are ways around this that don't involve throwing a bunch of GNN layers at it just to try to get the message from message passing. Yeah, a lot of this comes into the human engineering thing though, right? So uh, you could create inductive priors and you could say, I, 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 think, I think this thing's very important. And you could argue as some folks do that it's almost like a platonic, you know, like symmetries translation symmetry. I mean, that's a platonic ideal, right? That can't just be something that we've plucked out of thin air. It must be something really important, but there's always a bit of a spectrum of, of, of how important something is and, and isn't. But I, I wanted to bring this full circle a little bit. So, and first of all, folks, I recommend you check out, um, Zach's recent interview that he did with, with the folks from um, that paper equivariant subgraph aggregation networks. And, um, you know, the, as I understand the, the main idea behind that paper was the way that this message passing works in neural networks actually fails in certain cases. So there are certain functions that, that fails to represent. So they came up with this idea, well, why don't we create a policy to essentially decompose uh, a graph into lots of other graphs? And then we could represent them with, and, and that policy could be, I don't know, get, get me all the minimum spanning trees of this graph. That would be a dumb thing to do. Cause I think they said there's exponentially many of them, but, but something like that. And, and then, and then you, you stack all of those adjacency matrices and, and, and then you, you work on that. So they said that there's, um, an interesting analogy between, you know, there's this thing called the Weisfeller lemon isomorphism test. And they said there was an, an analogy between that and message passing. So anything that the. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, the, the WL test fails on message passing would fail on. So could you give us a bit of flavor on that? Yeah, there's a, a paper from Curie Leskovich's group on exploring the expressive power of GNNs, and they make this explicit connection to the one WL. So basically the, the theorem that they show is that anything that the one WL test fails on to, uh, you know, fails to discriminate between two graphs is whether they're the same or not, or isomorphic is the more precise term, uh, then GNNs will fail on that same thing. And it's be so let's first maybe describe the 1WL algorithm. It's, it's basically message passing. So the idea is that you have two graphs and you don't know whether they're the same or not, because it's actually not obvious by looking at them. You can rearrange the nodes and the way you draw them. And two things that look very different can actually be identical graphs. The algorithm goes, assign everything the same label to start off, or they call it a color. And you give everything, let's say, a zero. And then for each node, you gather all of the labels of its connected neighbors, and you create a multi-set. So what's the difference between a multi-set and a set is that the same element can occur more than once. So let's, let's say you have a node of degree three, meaning it has three neighbors, then when you collected its information, the multi-set would be three zeros because everything has the same 
uh, starting out. And then you also include the label information of the node itself. So you would have a zero and then its neighborhood would be zero, zero, zero. And then you would hash that and create a unique value for every unique set of um, neighborhood label sets. And let's say we call that one. Okay, so everything that had degree three in that first step would now have a label of one. And then you would do that for all of the other nodes. So basically what you're doing is you're finding all of the unique local neighborhoods and then assigning that a new label. And now you have that thing. And then you run this uh, again and again and again. So you end up getting this table that maps all of these unique structures to colors or labels or whatever. And you run this until it's converged. And if at the end, and by converged, it means that all of the uh, nodes that share a label in iteration K also share a label in iteration K plus one. So the actual label values will change, but all of the nodes that have the same color will have the same color again when you do it. So that's called convergence. And then if you compare the two graphs, those that uh, have basically the same distribution of labels are isomorphic. They're the same. And that's, that's the way um, we sort of test whether these two graphs are the same. And it turns out that there are, there are certain cases where, for example, let's say you have uh, six nodes. One of them is in a ring. and um, you can imagine different geometries and I, you'd probably have to flash some on the screen that are like these degenerate cases where basically they are very different graphs. You can tell that by looking at them, but if you run this one WL test, they say they are the same and it's known that that's the case. So the strongest claim you can make is that if two graphs fail the one WL test, they're not isomorphic. But if two graphs pass the 1WL test, you still don't know whether they're isomorphic or not. So it's only the failure case that gives you a definitive answer. And um, GCN or GNNs are basically doing the same thing, right? They're gathering the information, but instead of passing it through a hash function to generate the next label, they pass it through a neural network. So the connection here is that basically the GNNs are a differentiable version of the one WL test. And the one thing that they do, which is the source of their bottleneck, is that they aggregate that multiset. So instead of having zero, 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 or um, some list of labels, they apply some aggregation scheme. And they sum them, they average them, whatever it is they do, but they combine this neighborhood of information with some aggregation, which is what gives them their permutation invariance, by the way, this aggregation step. But uh, but that aggregation of collapsing this multiset into a single representation is the source of where they lose their ability to distinguish beyond what the 1WL can do. So there are certain cases where you can imagine I'm connected, let's say we're using the average aggregation function. Let's say I'm connected to two red and two blue. Well, if I average that, then I'm going to have half red and half blue. Now let's say I have four red and four blue. I'm going to get the same answer from the GCN because it's, at the end of the day, just going to average the proportion of these labels. The 1WL test would, would pass in that case because it would know that I have two versus four. So what the paper says is that the only way you can achieve the upper bound of this 1WL test is if you use a injective aggregation function. So it basically means that if you have a unique set of inputs, you generate a unique output and that the sum aggregator is the best we have. And um, that way you can imagine if you one hot encode all of your labels and you sum them, you get a count of how many red and how many blue. And then you can always sort of recreate the uh, same thing as what the hash function would do because you're getting a count of unique labels, assuming your vector is big enough to one hot encode all the possible labels. So that, that's the way they make the connection with the 1WL test is they basically say, we're going to fail in the same places because given the same inputs and we can never have better inputs than 1WL because again, you're just gathering the neighbors, we're going to fail in the same places. We'll also fail in more places if our aggregation function 
is not objective. So if we restrict it to these certain classes, then we can be as powerful as the 1WL test. And then they develop this architecture called graph isomorphism networks that basically leverages these ideas and, and comes up with a final kind of update solution that is guaranteed to uh, match the 1WL power. That's absolutely fascinating. I was trying to understand a little bit about this aggregation because uh, when we had Thomas Lux on the other day, uh, we, we spoke about in all of the architectures, there's this notion of permuting and then aggregating. And he thought that the secret was in the aggregation more than the permuting. But um, in a typical, uh, you know, we said there's the layers of the sandwich and there's the equivariant layers and there's the invariant layers. The equivariant layers don't aggregate or do they? The so the equivariant layers are basically the um, the ones that are going to give you an output for every node, mm -hmm. and um, so it's a little bit a GNN basically st stacks the equivariant and invariant together. So the um, invariant part comes in and collapsing the neighbors of a node into a single representation. So let's just be explicit because it's simpler. Let's say we're using the sum aggregator and you're just adding up the, uh, the features of all of the nodes. So then it doesn't matter whether you have three neighbors or 10 neighbors, you're going to get the same size output, right? Mm -hmm. If you add three vectors or 10 vectors. Also the order doesn't matter. So if you add vector one, two, three, or three, two, one, the sum operation is, uh, it, the order doesn't matter. So in that sense, th that's invariant. But if you apply that recipe to every node independently, where you say for node one, gather your neighbors and do that operation. Node five, gather your neighbors, do that operation. The fact that you're applying the same recipe to every node independently is what gives you your equivariance. Hmm. Because if you shuffle the nodes and apply that recipe again, the uh, the output you get, you know, now you'll get the output from node five with um, where you said was node one because you've swapped those things. But uh, it's not going to change the output you get for that particular node. It's just going to change the ordering. And that's because you've shuffled them. So that's the equivariance that comes in that basically for GNNs, applying the same neural network, the same weight shared neural network to each node independently gives you your equivariance. And then applying an aggregation to the neighborhood is your invariance. And you kind of stack that together to get both. Amazing. Amazing. Well, um, Zach, you've been creating a course. I mean, I know, I know you've been really busy because you, you stopped putting out videos on your channel about six months ago because you've been busy putting all of this course content together. Um, I had a quick look at the curriculum and I mean, I'm going to be signing up to this course myself. I'm really excited about it, but can, can you just tell folks, um, what's the structure of the course? How can they sign up and, and when are you running it? Sure. Um, it's kind of in two co components. One is theory and one is hands-on. So the theory covers a lot of what we were just talking about, but uh, the focus is not on being super exhaustive and being very long. It's instead focused on kind of finding the key ideas that underlie a lot of the seminal works and communicating them efficiently. And like, let's get you there quickly and, uh, and move on. But you know, it's not going to basically prepare you for uh, writing your dissertation probably, but it's going to unlock the kind of basic ideas that you need to know to understand some of these papers and read them and, and get the key ideas. So it goes through the graph Fourier transforms and, and convolution and so on, and basically builds up the math that you need to understand graph convolutional networks and the uh, bottlenecks and so on. The, the hands-on piece is a little bit different because I'm running it in cohorts of students. So the theory part you can kind of take whenever you want. The uh, hands-on piece enrollments only open for a couple of weeks, and then we close it down and, and run the session. And there's basically three segments where you are building GNNs through guided exercises, and there's videos that walk you through solutions and so on. And there's a Discord community where you can ask questions, and, and that's why I wanted it to be cohort-based so that people can kind of work through it together, code review, and so on. But the three main things we cover there are the, exam the three major uh, examples of where GNNs are applied, which is like a node classification, link prediction, and then graph classification. And those are kind of the three areas 
where uh, GNNs are applied today. So we do that. Right now, uh, enrollment is open, but it closes April 1st is when we're getting started. And then that'll run for six weeks and we'll probably open up enrollment again sometime after that in the summer. But that's kind of where it stands right now. Amazing. Well, um, I, I think it's so important to have a sense of community and, and buzz. I mean, we just recently started our Discord community. I, I know you, you've got one for your channel as well, Zach, and folks should should sign up to that. But um, it keeps you accountable, doesn't it? When when you're with a cohort, I mean, I remember when I went to university, just that sense of uh, collegial um, atmosphere and, and, and doing it, being in it with other people, I think that makes all, all the difference. Yeah, for me, the deadlines are really... Uh useful. You know, it's like, I don't like them and it adds stress to my life. But if I don't have any kind of deadlines, things, you know, everybody's so busy and other things come up. So I wanted to do it as a cohort and like have a start and a finish. And hopefully that encourages people to, to finish the actual work because that's really what it takes to learn something. Exactly. Was it Douglas Adams who said, um, deadlines make a whooshing sound when they fly past. (laughs) (laughs) It's just great. Well, um, Zach, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And, and by the way, um, if folks would like another dose of, of Zach, um, I was listening back to this recently. Um, uh, Zach came on and we had a discussion on the Social Dilemma film, the, um, the, the first of three, but it was by far the best of the three. And um, I was listening to it recently, Zach, and, and your, your contributions on that were absolutely amazing. So I, I definitely recommend folks go back into the catalog and, and listen to that one. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'd like to revisit it myself. It's been a long time. I hadn't thought about that movie in a while. So cool. Yeah, I know. It, it was such a, an interesting discussion because I, I was really inspired by another podcast called The Moral Maze. And I, I always wanted mm. to model our channel on that a little bit. And it's it's very kind of like academic and intellectual and going deep into things. And, and that was a great example of, you know, one of my original visions for MLST. So that was great. Well, speaking of, I've... I've really enjoyed watching what your channel has become and the the cool things you guys are doing and where you're pushing it it's it's been uh just a pleasure to watch so congratulations and please keep it up awesome zach thank you so much for coming on and, and we'll certainly have you back on soon i really appreciate it great thanks tim i hope you enjoyed the show folks uh if you like content like this remember to hit the like and subscribe button and uh consider rating our podcast on apple podcasts Also, uh, we're looking for sponsors as well. So if you're interested, reach out to me and we will see you on the next one.